everyone. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Um, today, we're returning to a topic that I've covered a number of times on the show, namely uh, the relationship between church and state. Um, probably the, the episode that I did that focused on this topic uh, most most consistently was my interview with Thomas Pink about uh, the thought of Leo XIII. And uh, the occasion for this this conversation is the publication of a wonderful, wonderful new book, The Politics of the Real, The Church Between Liberalism and Integralism. The author is my guest today, D.C. Schindler. He's a professor of metaphysics and anthropology at the John Paul II Institute in Washington, D.C., the author of a number of books, including The Catholicity of Reason and Freedom from Reality. And I'm very excited to have him on today. Uh, welcome, David, to the show. Oh, thank you, Thomas, for having me. I've been looking forward to it. When people discuss the relationship between church and state and people debate whether there should be, for example, a confessional state, a state that recognizes the true religion as, as such, um, one response that you often get is the the impracticality of it that these are sort of self indulgent debates that don't don't have any grounding in reality and i've i've always said the way i've always answered that is to say that well even if something is impractical um you you have to uh aim for heaven to get to purgatory so to speak and and that in conceptualizing um the, the structure of the universe, it's very important to get the relationship between the orders right, because otherwise you're going to have a, a disharmonious a disharmonious vision of things, and that that ebbs into every aspect of life. It ebbs into the family, you know, as much as the relationship between the church and state, for instance. Um, so, for example, you know, if you're if you're debating the question of uh, religious freedom in the state, in the the political society as a whole, um, the, the answers that you give to those questions have implications as to the way that one really raises one child, one's children in the faith, for, for example. In other words, you often run into people who uh, say, well, I'm letting my kids decide what religion yeah. <laughs> they're, they're going to practice. Right. Right. Um, I, I wanted to ask first about this question of practicality yeah. and why is it that that shouldn't be the first thing determining the scope of the things we think about no thank you that's that's a i mean there, there are so many issues packed into what you've just the simple point that you've raised I and mean, we could talk for an hour just about those things but uh just to just to make a, a few uh comments um uh to start off um <clears throat> when people raise a question of practicality um and and raise the question of um you know what, what what a confessional state what would be the point of envisioning a political order that recognizes the truth of the church when that is something that's simply not going to be feasible the assumption um behind that and um, first of all that's a serious question it's a, and it's an important question but the assumption uh is almost inevitably um, that we somehow live in a non-confessional state right now, that we somehow live in in a, a, a neutral state um, in which individuals are are able to pursue particular visions of, of what's true. And um, that that may be the case uh, superficially. It may look like that's the case, but but in fact, um, it's not so difficult to see once you once you sort of penetrate below the surface that, um, uh, that's far from the truth. It's, it's sort of like the, um, I mean, to, 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 to bring a, uh, an example that's in the news these days, um, uh, the Supreme Court decision about, uh, abortion. The idea was that the, the, uh, court had no authority to decide when human life begins. And so they would leave that open as an option. But of course, that's in fact a very clear decision about when life begins because of, uh, you, you, in a way you can't escape making a decision there. So leaving it open, in fact, is saying that those who um, uh, uh, affirm uh, the beginning of life from conception are, are wrong and have no claim, you see. Right. So it's, 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 a, it's actually a positive decision. And something similar could be said about um, the state in relation to uh, 
uh, the church in, in relation to religion. It seems to be a neutral setting up a neutral um, uh, zone to allow individuals to, to pursue religion. But in fact, that very act determines what is allowed to count for religion. So like you said, with a child, you let your child um, decide, you know, when he reaches uh, high school or something, he can make a decision what religion to follow. The, the, you, you've actually been imposing on him a conception of religion as something that an individual chooses from a place of indifferent freedom. And so that's a very distinctive view. That's a very, it's a theological judgment. It's a very distinctive view of what, what counts as religion. And you've imposed right. that on your child. You've taught that to your child. Um, and so you have already set the terms. Anyway, so th th it seems to me that's a good point to make right at the outset because it, um, it, it unmasks this assumption that we somehow are living in a neutral space so that those who would propose um, the church as an authority are are bringing something foreign into uh, into the playing field as you know in contrast to everyone else uh, that's just not the case so it's it's actually all we're already in the beginning sort of talking about competing visions so that's the first point um, the second point about practicality um, uh, a human being is a rational animal. And what that means is that, um, you know, we're not animals that have reason tacked on at the end. It means that every aspect of human life, even the most practical, um, you know, uh, 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 our, our need for physical survival and so forth, all of those things are rational in a human being. Our rationality reaches all the way down into our animal nature. And, and what that means is that um, uh, there's nothing that we do as human beings that isn't done according to some rational judgment about what's true, whether we're aware of it or not. Um, so, so the idea that we, um, uh, that we ought to leave considerations, um, sort of ideals, out of the picture and just be practical, we're, we, we in fact are establishing at a kind of a lower level an ideal, and we're going to fall short of that. It's sort of, Plato uses uh, the image, it's similar to what you say about aiming for heaven in order to reach purgatory. Plato says that um, when you, uh, a painter, um, uh, in, in painting a picture, is always in, the, the, the result of the painting is always going to fall short of the image that he was aiming at. But um, it precisely falls short of the ideal. You know, if he were to, to, to say, okay, that's going to happen, so I'm going to set the sights lower, you're, you're setting up uh, a lower level ideal that you're then going to fall short of again, and so forth. Yeah. So the only thing, the only rational way of acting is according to what is true in principle, what's tr what, what, the, what the actual ideal is. Now, once you've established that, you also then have to consider the pragmatic uh, um, you know, the situation, the, 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 the possibilities in a given situation, but they have to be possibilities that are illuminated by, in some sense, measured by what is true. And so, um, you know, to put it all in just a simple word, there's the, as human beings, we, we cannot avoid, uh, asking. And in some sense, in our thoughts and, and, and actions already answering the fundamental question, what is true? And so it seems to me we're, we, we do best by facing that and begin with the question right. about the truth of the matter. Well, for example, I mean, to say that it's impractical for the state uh, to, you know, confess the true religion and then thus we shouldn't spend time talking about it. Um, that means that you're not going to be what, – whatever um, concessions you make to practicality are going to be gone, done under false pretenses if they're That's not right. done in full awareness of what the best is or what the perfect is. And so you're going to uh, subscribe to ideas such as neutrality. That's right. Rather than realizing that that's – that doesn't exist. Um, right. And then, and then you make, you make neutrality 
the good that measures all the other goods. And, and right. I mean, we have, we have an, uh, you know, absolutely common experience of that with tolerance. You know, any, any view is accepted insofar as it conforms to this universal sta- standard that we're imposing on everyone called uh, tolerance. So that's a very definite conception of the good that's being universally imposed as a measure for all, um, uh, you know, private goods. And uh, but but as you say, you know, there's something sort of dishonest in that because we we don't recognize that we're actually promoting a distinctive conception of the good. Um, we we claim to be doing just the opposite, and and so there's you know in a way it becomes a much more insidious <laughs> um, uh, uh, process because it it never identifies itself. It becomes kind of a, a hidden manipulative sort of imposition of a definite concept of the good. And that's just, you know, to, to use, uh, you know, modern terms, that's just not fair. (laughs) Right. Now, this is a very philosophically rich book and we're not going to be able to cover all of the, um, the points made in detail. Um, so before we get into details, perhaps you could give a general overview of the structure of the whole book. Sure. No, thanks. Yeah, the um um the the book uh I'll refresh my memory here. It's it's first of all it was it was prompted by this uh sense that uh, cr- uh criticisms of liberalism were becoming uh very f- common. Uh, I think um in fact it's it's quite extraordinary the 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 illiberalism movement um and and the the infinite varieties that exist of that already. Um, uh, that's, that's clearly one of the most potent movements, um, today. And, uh, you know, in, in one respect, um, especially by virtue of my, my, my father's work, my, my father, I, I, I really do think was one of the pioneers of this, uh, criticism of liberalism from a Catholic perspective. Um, uh, but, um, uh, I've, I've sort of grown up with a, with a criticism of, of, of liberalism and it, and it occurred to me that we're, we're moving into sort of the next stage, which is um, uh, to spend more time attempting to um, sketch out an alternative proposal. So not simply uh, raise criticisms, but, but uh, uh, sketch something, propose something in its place. So that was sort of the main um, impetus driving this book. So there, there, there are three basic parts. In the first part, um, uh, I've tried to sort of summarize the critique and, and present as kind of a synthetic criticism, um, uh, bringing together a number of different strands, a criticism of the, the common conception of what politics, political order is in America. Um, so there are three chapters there. There are three parts with three chapters apiece, so very Trinitarian, of course. Um, the, um, the second part is called uh, reorienting things, and uh, um, th- the idea there was to begin with these, to point to these foundations of uh, political order. Uh, three things it seems to me um, are, are really at the foundation of liberal political order. So first, um, rights; um, second, property; and third, um, uh, religious freedom. And uh, I thought that I would take a look at these three things and. Uh, sketch out the liberal conception and then uh, an alternative Catholic conception of these, of these things. And it's interesting. um, No one uh, has picked this up and I didn't really expect anyone to, um, but property, um, the chapter on property is the central chapter of the book. And I really have become more and more convinced that how we understand property is one of the most fundamental questions in all of this. Um, it's a really uh, beautiful so three, chapter and I, uh, but I, but I'd be interested for you to later expand on why you think that's the central chapter. Sure. No, I, I'd, I'd love to, I, uh, I, it's an endlessly fascinating topic. And then, uh, the third part is, is, um, it's called a truly Catholic politics and the, and the, uh, uh, purpose there was to, uh, try to, um, sketch out, um, how this, proposal that I'm making in this book, The Politics of the Real, might differ from other Catholic uh, proposals about politics or Catholic critiques of, of um, uh, liberalism. Uh, so the, the, the chapter seven is um, contrasting this with a, 
you might call sort of a culture war model of engagement. Um, the second uh, uh, of that part, um, chapter eight, uh, is um, an engagement with integralism, which I think is one of the most interesting of the Catholic um, uh, proposals. Um, and of course, has many different uh, varieties, um, increasingly many uh, varieties today. And then, and then the last, pr uh, prudence and tragedy, chapter nine, which is a, a short, a shorter chapter, but in in, in a certain sense, responds to um, uh, the point that you made at the outset about practicality and uh, uh, engages with, uh, you might say, Catholic neoconservatism. A certain uh, perspective that um, that you find in in Catholic uh, neoconservatism. So, so that's that's the basic structure of the book in a nutshell. Um, okay, so it seems like a, a good place to to begin or to preface the the points we'll be discussing today would be to discuss this idea of the, the Christian form that you introduced at the beginning of the book. I don't necessarily want to go deep into the Jewish and the Greek and the Roman. Uh, right. you know, inheritance separately, but the, this yeah. idea of Christianity as a, as a, as a historical form is really crucial to the discussion of what liberalism does and how the way that it transforms Christianity. So it seems like we at least should introduce that. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's kind of a pivotal, uh, point. And I've been developing it in, in other contexts and other writings, uh, since then. But the, the idea is, um, that we have to recognize uh, Christianity not just as a, a faith and in the sense of you know an interior act of you know of, of the will, uh, which it of course is that that's a fundamental part of it, but it's not the whole of what it means to be Christian. Um, Christianity, the argument is that um, it's uh, uh, you know when we think of the uh, the incarnation, the principle of the incarnation, the body of Christ and the church as the extension of the body of Christ in, into space and time. It's a, it's, it's a, um, you might say a gathering up of the whole of human existence, but in some sense, the whole cosmos, the fathers of the church are excellent on that, that sort of cosmological sense of the incarnation. It's meant to gather up the whole of existence, um, uh, uh, according to a particular form. That's what, that's what redemption is. It's not simply, um, a ticket that gets punched, for the afterlife and then this world is you know the secular um left to its own devices but this the um redemption is the is the transformation of the world and of human existence in the world so um my argument is that 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 uh um we can best understand that um uh the the christian transformation of the world if we think of it as a form that gathers up uh the greek dimension which is the nature um nature especially in its philosophical scientific and philosophical dimensions um uh the romans which is the uh culture and institution and law and the human creative element that gives order to things and then the the jewish dimension which is um the the radical god-centeredness of existence and obedience to god um you know we we spontaneously connect uh christianity with the jewish you know the, the the new testament fulfills the old but i think we need to understand what's distinctively christian is that um just as the new testament fulfills the old so too does uh the revelation of christ and the existence of church take up and transform the greek and the roman dimensions now um that's sort of a long explanation, but the, the reason that it's important to see that, at least the, uh, the argument that I'm making in the book, is um, it sets up what I, uh, my particular proposal for a definition of liberalism. And the proposal, the definition of liberal, because all of it is going to hang on how you define, how precisely you define liberalism. And uh, my claim in this book, and there are others that are making this claim too, um, is that liberalism is defined most basically as rejecting the Christian form. So re as a rejection of not, not necessarily Christian faith, but rejecting Christian faith qua church as, uh, and church as um, a, a, a reality in the world. So, so it's, a re it's a rejection of 
this sense that Christ makes a claim on the whole of existence. <clears throat> um, there, there are many dimensions to that, but, but one of them is, is, you know, the obvious one is, is the um, rendering of uh, faith, something individual and private, and then you sort of liberate the spheres of nature and culture um, to be, to, to, to um, exist and, and sort of pursue their own ends in a purely sort of immanentist or secular way. Um, <clears throat> and it seems to me that liberalism uh, ha has done that. I mean, one can show that historically speaking, um, but, but it's, it's, it's a subtle point because um, uh, uh, a lot of the elements get recovered you know, there's there's a new embrace of science. There's a new embrace of of law and rights and so forth from the Romans. But they're precisely recovered outside of the Christian synthesis, outside of the church, effectively. And um, it seems right. to me that that implies a kind of a fragmentation of existence. That that you know the 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 effects of which we're we're starting to see with a certain uh, intensity in the uh, 21st century, but if, but have been there, the seeds have been there for a very long time. Right. And that would be your response to someone like Robert Riley, who I had on this show before, who in his book, America on trial argues for the way in which, um, the classical liberal tradition or the American founding, um, uh, incorporated all of the, these ideas that had their roots in, um, the, the, the Greco -Roman. early centuries of the church, the Greco-Roman right. world, and the medieval development of canon law and all these different things that he cites. But you're, you're saying that it takes these things in a piecemeal way. And even if it takes them, even if it took all of these elements individually, yeah. it does so in a way that separates them and disjoints them from existing in, so to speak, a living body of the Christian form as a, as an actual concrete tr tradition embodied by the Catholic church. That's right. No, thank you for, for pointing that out. Cause that's a subtle point that, um, it seems to me people have missed and it's absolutely crucial. Um, you know, and Robert Riley is such an excellent example because, you know, such a thoroughly documented book and, and, uh, it's been, um, right. had a, had a great success. I mean, you see a perfect example of what, uh, you know, it is that I'm, criticizing he, um and and it's it's interesting i mean he himself says yes the the american tradition has has picked up all of these elements and he, he says but of course you know um uh puts them on you know interprets them on uh, uh on new grounds it, mm -hmm. you know he s sort of acknowledges it's a novel way of synthesizing these elements um but they're all there and and the the point is not whether or not they're there but in precisely the grounds you know what is it that holds them together what how how they how they relate to each other because uh, in fact i mean it's extraordinary one one could spend a great deal of time thinking about how um you know if it was the case so here's the grand <laughs> suggestion proposal if it was the case that these things were were meant that just as as God's providence prepared, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Hebrew, uh, people for the coming of Christ. So too analogously, so not in exactly the same way, but analogously, um, the Greek and Roman, uh, uh, world was prepared, um, that in fact, it means that these, that these elements need each other, that, that the, um, that these dimensions of human existence, flourish precisely in their synthesis so we understand best what uh law is if we if we see it connected to nature <laughs> so natural law we, we understand and and connected to god and so forth that these these elements need to to be um interpreted in light of each other um or else we end up with a with a i think a, a deeply problematic fragmentation okay so in this book you say well, you just said that liberalism is the rejection of the Christian form. Uh, you also say that liberalism could be defined as the political form of evil, uh, <laughs> a very strong statement. Yeah, yeah. And you have a very specific sense of what that means. And it, and it really has to do with this distinction between um, 
act and potency. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe we can introduce that idea that that the idea of that liberalism starting with God makes makes God into a God of potency. Yeah. Well, so it's it's um, uh, I actually stand by that phrase, even though it's, it sounds extreme, but but I mean it in a very particular way. And I'll and I'll come back to it. Um, uh, uh, I think I refer to this in the book. C.S. Lewis has a has a beautiful image about the, the de-Christian Christianizing of the West, which is a kind of disincarnation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this this um, assertion of a kind of neutral secularity pretends to be uh, hearkening back to um, the pre-Christian era. But in fact, you can't pretend that Christianity didn't happen. And right. to go back to that, you, you have to actually reject what came between. Right. So he said it's it's sort of like a, a, a divorced woman um, uh, claiming to be a virgin again. Um, I mean, in a sense, that, that's, that doesn't, that's, you know, you can't undo history. Right. Um, similarly, you know, the, the, the church has existed and God has in fact revealed himself in history. And so in order to try to, to recover a pre-Christian sense of nature, you actually have to reject what's given. So, uh, neutrality is, is, can only be apparent. It's actually to, to attain neutrality, you need to actually neutralize or um, eliminate the claim of, deny the claim of what is already given. And, and if that's the case, it, it means that, that um, and if, you know, if liberalism was an attempt to, to try to rethink political order sort of outside of the Christian tradition, it means that the, the, the very forms of liberalism um, uh, uh, ha- have the character of this rejection of the Christian claim that's sort of baked into the forms of, of, of liberalism. You know, T.S. Eliot has some wonderful um, uh, reflections on how liberalism, this kind of negating of this freedom from this movement away from this sort of fundamental no or denial that's kind of baked into to liberalism. You see, you see that in, the, in its um, tendency to fragment and to, to dis- dissolve um, which I think is something we're all we're all aware of. <clears throat> um, if you connect that point with this larger argument that the the very heart of liberalism is is kind of turning away from the church, um, then you you see what it means to say that liberalism is the political form of evil. Um, I mean, just to 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 work out the syllogism there, you know, if if um, uh, if uh, evil is a privation of the good, a turning away from the good. And if the good is God, and if God has, in fact, revealed himself in history, then uh, a, a turn away from the church, from the actual tradition, as it is given in history, is, regardless of one's, you know, intentions, one's motivations, one can be doing it for, you know, for all sorts of very understandable human reasons, you know, uh, um, uh, w- desire to be inclusive, um, uh, uh, a, a rejection of abuse and corruption and so forth. I mean, there are thousands of very understandable reasons, but w- whatever the reasons happen to be, objectively speaking, um, the, the form is this taking a place outside of the Christian tradition. And so that is a, a rejection right. of God and therefore it's, a, it's evil you know, as a privation. Um, so this isn't the, uh, so this isn't the, the God of the philosophers in search of something more concrete on the way to something more concrete. This is the God of the philosophers taken as refusing to acknowledge at least on a public level. And we'll get into that issue later. Sure. Yeah. Um, the, the Christian God. That That's right. I mean, um, the, the God of the philosophers uh, is, uh, you know, I, I have a, a lot of love for the God of the philosopher. So I, um, uh, but the God of the philosophers in a way is, is God prior to his, um, I'm going to qualify that in a moment, but prior to his actual revelation in, in, in history. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, again, it, 
the, the history matters. Um, uh, it's very different to, to, you know, this is, this is Paul's, um, uh, speech at the Areopagus in Acts, you know, the, the, the Greeks have an unknown God that they, that they worship. And he reveals to them that that unknown God is, uh, the God of Jesus Christ. Um, so the God of the philosophers turns out to be the God of Jesus Christ. Um, uh, to try to, um, you know, sort of erase the history, take a few steps back and bracket out the actual revelation of God in right. Christ. It's, it's no longer the God of the philosophers actually it becomes something very different. And, and, and you see that, in, you know, in fact, the sort of academic discussions of the philosophical God are so radically different from the ancient, uh, uh, philosophical approach to God, um, precisely because the ancients weren't setting aside theology because there was no such thing, whereas, you know, the moderns do. And so it changes, it changes the philosophy. But, um, right. So that's why I mentioned act and, and potency, although the potential is a word that you, you use in the book discussing this, uh, because it's, it's God in this abstracted sense as God who could do any number of things, um, not as God who did do the things that he actually did. Um, and yeah. so it really, in a sense, even though, yes, God, uh, God didn't necessarily have to do things exactly as he has done them. He, he, these are free acts of God. Right. It's because he has actually done them to speak as though he didn't is to reduce him to potency. Uh, or, or, or as you put it, actualizing a potency precisely qua potency uh, yeah. in the book. Yeah, you know, and that, that, that sounds like a, you know, that's a very sort of, um, uh, you know, high level um, metaphysical set of terms there, which, um, uh, you know, may, may appear abstract. But the, the, the point, but I, but I think they're actually very important and very helpful in thinking through a lot of these questions um, in, in political philosophy, as a matter of fact. But um, yeah, it's, 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 uh, that that problem can be traced back um, to uh, the nominalism in the late medieval period, where they made a distinction between God's um, potentia absoluta, his absolute power, and his potentia ordinata, which is his ordained powers, the way it gets translated. But the idea is um, God as he actually is. So given given uh, God's actual uh, decisions, um, if you will, that's a bit anthropomorphic but for the sake of argument given how god has actually turned out to be in the actual decisions he's made and so forth versus what god could have done mm -hmm. um uh potentially um and at, at, uh in in the in the early middle ages um the 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 thought about what god could have done you know uh could any of the you know, persons of the Trinity been, been incarnate instead of the Son. Could God have become incarnate in a in an ass as opposed to a man? Could God, you know, these sorts of questions? They were understood to be abstractions, abstract questions. But what happens um, um, uh, towards the end of the Middle Ages is that they become reified, and so one right. begins to think that the way God happened to reveal Himself is just one face that he was showing to the world. But the truth of God is this absolutely in infinitely unpredictable power. Um, right. Uh, right. And, you know, and, 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 you know, once you do that, I mean, Christianity becomes just, you know, one possible religion among many. Um, right. You, you don't know whether, you know, the natural law loses its foundation, you know, um, uh, one could go on and on, but you see, you see the point. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's tricky because um, you have to retain the freedom of God and not have it so that his providential dispositions are just sort of necessary emanations from, from who and what he is. But at the same time, recognize that the way he has reveal, revealed himself is in fact the best, the perfect, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the perfect way for him to reveal himself. No, you're, uh, thank you for making that point. That's a, a crucial point. So absolutely. It's not arbitrary. 
It's not arbitrary. Yeah, no, but and but this is um, here's to me that the decisive thing, um, this question of whether God had to become incarnate or he didn't have to. When we ask that question, we tend to step outside of what God actually did. Right. And think of God as being faced with these two choices. And and then we're forced into a dilemma. Was God compelled by some logic to, to, to become incarnate? Or did was he not compelled? And so it was something that was kind of an arbitrary act. But both of those sort of start with the abstract God of possibility. So in other words, that's your, as opposed to beginning with the actual God revealed in, in, in history, you see, um, uh, uh, it's, it's the, the, the question, um, really depends on your starting point for reflection, what you take to be the absolute to which everything else is relative. So one can affirm, uh, the, begin with the actuality of God's revelation in Christ and therefore in the church, you know, in Mary and in the church, and then say that, see that, through the, the 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 nature of this revelation, we see that God is, you know, infinitely free, and and uh, in in a kind of an abstract sense, God could have could, could have uh, acted in infinitely different ways, but we we can trust that they would all, in a way, share um, uh, features with analogously with what He in fact has done, because this is the tr- this is in a way. Um, um, this is the truth of God made manifest. So perhaps we can continue with this point in uh, referring to your discussion of the Declaration of Independence, which I found to be a really subtle but kind of devastating argument about the phrase, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Um, And uh, you, you make the case that um, the word nature actually has a p- polemical function, which ultimately serves to emancipate the political order from God, from a God with any real authority. Mm-hmm. Um, so perhaps we can start with um, nature itself and then talk about what nature's God actually means. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, one of the best um, sources on the question of the meaning of nature is the short essay um, – short but very dense essay by Robert Spamon, um, uh, which is published in the Robert Spamon Reader of uh, Oxford University Press. It's, it's an excellent presentation. And, and he points out there that um, the, the pre-modern notion of nature uh, always understood nature to be analogously re- related to other things. So uh, the, the most obvious would be something like nature and culture, that in one sense, we distinguish what's natural from what's cultural, but we also recognize that um, from another perspective, they're not opposite simply because culture is expression of human nature. And uh, in fact, um, uh, as he as he shows um, this, this what we might call an analogical conception of nature implies that um, uh, nature is not closed off to meanings that transcend it, but in fact, it uh, it has this it, it it gets taken up into to ever higher levels of meaning um, and flourishes in those and so from that conception of nature you you understand that that culture has a, a, a significant role to play culture and therefore all human institutions have a significant role to play in the meaning of nature um, nature is m- more natural when it's part of human culture rather than understood as something simply opposed to to human culture, which then becomes purely artificial. And not just that, but that man, in fact, concretely does not exist outside of culture. That's right. And society. That's right. Yeah. This is especially clear in human nature, but um, we have to understand man is part of the natural world too. So what's true about human nature is analogously true about culture in general. That's really a a crucial point. Now, from that perspective, um, uh, the, the, the meanings of nature were always mediated through human institutions, especially the means of, 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 of human nature. And w- what happens, again, most dramatically in the late Middle Ages is, is, a, is a bifurcation. Um, uh, there's for, for reasons that are connected in some ways to the nominalism we were just talking about in this new conception of God's power, you know, 
rather than God as the good, we understand as all goodness, we understand God as all powerful, first of all. It, um, if I may, that's actually a nice uh, summary of the point that I was trying to make. It's very different if you uh, start with God as all good and interpret his power in light of that. You sort of integrate the meaning of power into into love, essentially. Or you start with God as all infinite power and think right. of goodness as just like one of the things he can do there. That's two radically different senses of everything. Right. Um, so in the, in the, uh, in the, in the more integrated, uh, sense, um, uh, where, where, where nature was sort of mediated by culture, um, uh, um, there was a sense of, of, um, he, you know, the human institutions such as law and, and, uh, structures of authority and, 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 and culture, um, as, as, uh, bringing to light the meaning of nature. Um, and this this coincided with a, a, a sense of nature as having intrinsic meaning, uh, a kind of a, a what we call a teleological sense of nature, nature that that is ordered to ends and that can be helped by uh, um, culture to 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 achieve those ends in some respect. Um, what happens in the late Middle Ages is those things get separated, and so now culture becomes the opposite, or sorry, nature becomes the opposite of culture. Um, it, it, it is interpreted as being totally and perfectly self-contained. Um, and uh, in fact, um, uh, especially in, in certain contexts, the political context being one of those, it comes to, to mean the sort of polemical opposite, that which um, um, uh, 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 restrains the claims of uh, politics. So, one begins right. to appeal to natural rights, for instance, now over and against political authority, ecclesial authority, um, and cultural institution. It becomes to, to, to affirm natural rights is in a way to give yourself a, a leverage outside of um, cultural medi culturally mediated um, uh, realities. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, that's um, th that's the meaning of nature that is very much the common um, coin of the uh, Enlightenment. Um, you know, if if the coin was sort of minted in the late Middle Ages, it's it's in full circulation um, by the time of the Enlightenment, and it's it's what's funding. Uh, I apologize for all the financial metaphors here, but it's it's sort of what's funding um, the vision of the the founders um, who seek to establish a political order um, that's outside of the, the preceding traditions of any sort. I mean, they were quite excited about this, um, this experiment. Um, and, you know, if that's the case, then the ultimate principle can't be a historically mediated one. It can't be the God who has, in fact, revealed himself in history. It can't be the God of the church. You know, right. uh, it has to be God now in this purified sense that's abstracted from history. Um, yeah. And that's the that's nature's God. You know, uh, j the, not all of the founders had exactly the same vision of things. Some of them wanted, um, you know, more explicit references to Christianity. That was very clearly Jefferson's uh, vision. But they weren't all on board with that. But it seems to me even the ones that were more... Um, in, more insistent on uh, recalling the Christian dimensions of uh, of political authority, it it was still not in this in this robust sense at all that we're talking about. Um, right, and so then when you talk about nature as God, it goes back to what we were talking about before: actualizing a potency, uh, precisely qua potency. And you ask in the book, "Is nature as God an actual authority?" Um, arguing that nature's God is essentially meant to be a genus mm -hmm. that potentially includes any number of different versions of that, Species. that uh, especially within different Christian denominations, to be fair, right. that the founders imagined people living in this country uh, would want to worship and would all recognize as an authority that made these, these abstract laws that we can all recognize as yeah. a bare minimum. Um, but 
nature's God, you know, as we were talking about before, a, a generic God doesn't exist. Right. Uh, as you refer to Aristotle pointing out, a genus doesn't actually exist. Um, it, it only has concrete existence in specific individuals right. um, and, and much more the case when there's only one possible God, right. you know, there is no genus God at all. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so nature's God ultimately, as I was saying before, elevates potency, the potency of a genus over the act, the, the actual concrete God that exists. Right. And so it's something that doesn't really have any concrete authority. It is, it is, um, uh, a sort of a fictive idea and a um, a concept. It's something onto which you can project whatever you think the content of, of of morality or whatever it is. That's right. That's right. And you might have consensus, uh, you know, at first for a time uh, that just the the generic affirmation of God implies a certain set of moral principles. But um, but there's no reason to hold to that. You know that 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 in a way. Um, uh, because it's not, because the concept, the mere concept of God has no actual authority. Um, uh, there's, there's no foundation for that. There's no real principle of unity. And so it, it seems to me that it's simply a matter of time. You know, the, 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 uh, the analogy would be, um, you know, um, how many, you know, uh, I sometimes ask, um, uh, people this, you know, how many, um, Protestant denominations are there registered in the United States and of course it's much more than people normally think and this was you know a decade ago the number was over 30,000 um, you know how many Catholic you know how many Catholic churches are there? and there's one right there's something there's something about um, uh, and you know the Catholic Church is in all sorts of difficulty these days and we we all we all know the 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 infighting um uh but there's nevertheless um uh uh you know in in principle a single catholic church is precisely why there's so much infighting whereas um it's it's sort of natural to uh protestantism to to fragment into splinter and that was that was the case from the beginning why Uh, you no longer have um an actual authority like a sort of a magisterial authority that that right. that that guides um you know the interpretation of scripture um uh the 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 development of doctrine if you will um uh but instead because the the actual authority has been eliminated you have individual you know you might say all protestants are united in the in the idea that that the bible is supreme but because there's not an actual authority that is the custodian, you might say, of the meaning of Scripture, the absolute authority of the Bible can mean an infinite number of things. To there's, do you see what I mean? And it seems to me yeah. it's very similar with you know because there's no actual authority that's connected to nature's God. Nature's God just becomes a concept that is open to an infinite number of interpretations, um, right. and that's sort of where we are. And so that doesn't bind us together. And not just open to it, as we were saying before, uh, it's not that it's it's prior to those interpretations yeah. coming to light. Yeah. You pointed out that it matters whether we consider the nature's God from within the tra- Catholic tradition or outside it yeah. as an abstract principle. Right. But when considered after the Catholic uh, tradition, outside of it as an abstract principle, um, well, I'll, I'll just quote you. You say nature's God represents the highest possible point of leverage for prying man out of any and all cultural context. And I I think it's also important to mention what you say in the book, which is that this is not a claim that this was intended by all of the founders, but that the logic is inherent in the idea. And it inevitably, um, uh, insofar as we really internalize that logic, it inevitably works itself out historically. That's right. I mean, it could be, I mean, again, with the analogy of Protestantism, there's no, um, there's, uh, you know, I, it, it seems to me evident that Protestants, in some ways, maybe even more deliberately and consciously, seek unity. Um, uh, but there's something about the very logic of it that um, uh, entails a kind of a, 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 a fragmentation, uh, makes that yeah. sort of fragmentation, um, you know, all, all but inevitable. Um, it's not that it, you know, 
th that it's a, a, a logically you know deterministic process. Some people think that there's Hegel lurking behind these arguments. I mean, it's not that at all. It's a matter of um, the the basic horizon which in, within which we think and act that disposes us one way or another. Um, yeah. And that 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 horizon that's set by a, a mere concept and not an actual reality um, is going yeah. to be one that that disposes us towards fragmentation. Because it's not the, the purpose of nature's God is not to open, you know, society to eventually, you know, as a public order, finding that the concrete true God, right. um, it's intended to by most of the founding fathers, as I understand it, to to eliminate religious conflict, which Europe had been plagued by. Um, but as you put it, insofar as it it actively resists integration because it's made in principle agnostic right. on the public level, it becomes a principle of active disorder. There you go. Excellent. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think um, I think from there it's worth talking about the um, the idea of tradition and its relation to the liberal order. Mm -hmm. um, because you refer to this idea that um, uh, the American founding allows a number of different traditions, but precisely as not traditional. Right. Um, so the idea is that a, a tradition is something that precedes us. It's not something that we exist outside of and then choose. I mean, it can be, I suppose, if you're not Catholic and then you become Catholic, but that, but, but only in the sense that you are choosing to graft yourself onto yeah, a tradition that already exists. Yeah, you're into the tradition. Yeah. 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 And if you think and of so, it as, as an option that you've happened to choose and you might change your mind, then you haven't entered into, into it. Right. So it's something that precedes you and it makes a claim on you prior to your making any any particular choice. And so this this gets to this really core idea of your book that that uh, in allowing these different belief systems, so to speak, or traditions, uh, more essentially, uh, as various options, uh, liberalism ultimately redefines them. And so it actually evacuates them as of their meaning and of their structure as traditions and therefore there is no real religious freedom under liberalism right. for that reason because it, it it in allowing religions as options not not in accepting the fact of religious plurality which you talk on, talk about later in the book which right. is a different matter right. um, but but in conceiving them as options right. Essentially, right. what it does is it it transforms them That's fundamentally, right. and so what you get is liberal Christianity under the form of liberalism. Yeah, you get Christ, you get faith as an individual option, as an option of you know a, a discrete act of the will um, that is not uh, you know that operates from a position outside of the uh, of the tradition. And that's just a you know that's a uh, a, a, a very particular conception of what the human being is and what human freedom is but it's it's sort you know and and there's a, again there's an illusion here because people you know nobody's telling you you can't believe x y or z it's just saying that insofar as you believe it you can only affirm it as an option that you as an individual are choosing and that's that's a you know so the the, the nature of it is being it's it's you know I I use the example um, in the book of um, the, the old uh, uh, comedian uh, Stephen Wright um, who uh, if you remember him his his mm -hmm. jokes were all just one liners but one of his lines was uh, uh, you know the other night I came home to my apartment and found that everything had been stolen and replaced with an identical replica. Um, uh, you know, I mean, in a certain sense, liberalism sort of takes everything that we have and gives it back to us. But now it's, it looks the same in one respect, but it's totally different. An example would be marriage, you know, so, so, um, uh, marriage, you know, has had a meaning throughout history and, um, you know, the, the recent, uh, decision by the Supreme Court to accept, to, you know, to accept um, uh, same-sex unions as marriage, um, on the surface, it sounds like we're just allowing, you know, t t we're affirming this long tradition and just allowing new people to participate in the same tradition. But in fact, in order to accept those unions, the, the definition of marriage has to change. 
And, and so the, the, the very meaning of what it means to be married has changed. And so now, in fact, you, you know, you say that, that, um, this isn't being imposed on anybody where, you know, people are still allowed to believe in traditional marriage. That's actually not true. You, um, you're no longer allowed to have a traditional marriage. Now you're allowed to have, uh, uh, the, you know, now what you had up to that point thought was a traditional marriage has been transformed into, you know, the new definition. And that's, that's what right. it means now publicly. That's what it means universally. And, and because marriage is an essentially public inst- institution, it, it, it changes the, the, the reality in some respect. You know, it can never change it in right. its foundation, but it, but it, so, so it does, um, it's not neutral and it's not, um, there's, uh, uh, it's, it's quite a, you know, I, in the other, in another book, um, I use the term diabolical, um, uh, quite a bit as a, uh, the, 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 um, etymological meaning of the word diabolical. It's, it's the exact opposite of the symbol. Um, symbol means mm-hmm. a joining together, a binding together. And the, the diabole in Greek means to set apart, to put asunder, um, uh, in a way that's deceptive, uh, uh, as, as, you know, all the associations we have with the word. And, and it seems to me that's what, 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 uh, so many of these, these, um, institutions of liberalism are kind of diabolical substitutes for the reality. They, they appear to be giving you the same thing, but in a way that is separating people from each other, you know, from the tradition, uh, from God, from the church, um, uh, you know, in that sense, it's a, it's a, it's an urgent matter. Uh, I'm sorry. Could you speak up a little bit? You, you got a little I bit. I faded uh, a bit there. Yeah. Quiet there. I just, yeah. the, 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 um, the, it seems to me one of the hallmarks of the, of liberalism and the institutions that have grown in liberalism is precisely to, um, uh, create these sort of diabolical substitutes for, um, uh, these human realities so things that in, in, in one superficial way look the same, but in fact have been reoriented in their, in their foundations. And so now effectively, rather than joining us together, um, as, as people, as a people in, in, in relation to God, they actually separate us from God and therefore from people and therefore ultimately from ourselves. I mean, we, you know, there's a, there's a, a radical bifurcation in the, the, you know, the very center of the person we've divided soul from body now. So the, the, the body doesn't reveal anything about who we actually are. Um, uh, it seems to me that that's, that question is related to, uh, how we understood religious liberty, <laughs> uh, for, for decades. Right. It reminds me of a Wall Street Journal editorial. I can't remember. I think Michael Hamby might have been one of the authors um, on the gender issue. I think it was last year. And there was a line, something like, we're all transgender now. That's right. Yeah. Um, and and the idea is that if you teach school children that, you know, to accept the transgender identity of one of one of their classmates, you're not just telling something about their classmate, you're 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 throwing into question um, you're throwing into question their their own identity that and that of their parents and everybody they know, and and so you know as I've always felt that the term cisgender, meaning someone who identifies as their biological sex, that actually does redefine me. It's not just putting a name on what I what I already am. It is they're actually foisting a gender identity on me by calling me that. That's absolutely true, and I mean, and and the thing is, it's obviously true. I it I mean, it's yeah. it doesn't really take much. There's there's nothing um, sort of controversial about the the affirmation. It's quite it's quite evident. I mean, because you you make gender an option, and that means that that uh, what had been just a given reality now becomes treated as if it were a choice, and that right. changes the nature of the thing. Yeah, yeah, and and so so with religion, as we've been saying, exactly. Um, now you talk about. Uh, well, we were just talking about how religious freedom is not true religious freedom in, in liberalism because of the way that it reduces it to an individual choice and an interior assent. Um, but uh, this this leads into a discussion of the common good. Um, 
we were saying that the, the, the reality of Christ, the reality of the church or the reality of whatever tradition you belong to, um, it precedes your choice um, or your assent to belong to it, whether you, you were born into that tradition or raised in it or came into it as an adult. Nonetheless, it precedes your any any choice to uh, or affirmation of belonging to it. Um, and it's and it's those things that and particularly with Christ in the church, it's those things that make possible freedom and faith rather than being merely objects of our free choice or objects of faith. Um, and uh, then you, you go on to say precisely to the extent that a thing is not given as a reality beforehand, i.e. prior to the agency of individuals, it can be neither common nor in fact a good, simpliciter or simply speaking. Yeah. Now, the reason I bring this up is because um, I think it's important to address the question um, then that, that then, then arises because a lot of people, as you point out in the book, would make a distinction between the state – and society as a whole, or specifically civil society. Yeah. And they would say, well, okay, but there's a larger common good out there, and the state is only dealing with a small a small part of that. And religion, uh, just because religion isn't a matter for the state, uh, does not mean that it's it's not part of the, the common good, it, even if it's not part of the political common good, strictly speaking. So how would you respond to that claim? Um. Yeah, that's that's there's a lot that would have to be answered there. Um, uh, and I would have it would take a good bit of time to give a complete answer to the question, but um, to, to make a couple of basic points that I think uh, are the beginning of, a, of an answer is um, uh, for, first of all, you know, the, the, the division between the state and civil society is already a kind of a, a, a modern, um, it's a it's a, a liberal. Um, concept. It's, those are liberal categories already that, that presuppose mm -hmm. um, a, a, a kind of uh, dualism in, in human existence. But um, uh, one of the one of the problems in that conception, it seems to me, is um, that uh, we we fail to understand the um, symbolic character of uh, authority, political authority. So you know we 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 tend we we think that we can reduce uh, political authority to um, just legal institutions, which we call the state, and then uh, marginalize their their uh, relationship to to um, uh, human life. But but in in fact, um, uh, you know, law is laws are inconceivable except as an attempt to give some expression to what it means to be human and the political order um is 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 in a way um, uh, a, the realization of a vision of human existence and it is that inevitably it, does, it it's it's not um it's that's not only the case insofar as rulers attempt to impose a, a view it's sort of natural to human existence for it to take uh, a political form, which is to say, um, the form of an articulate, you know, an, an, an articulation of of, of meaning, um, uh, you know, and be, be uh, if because that's the case, um, this this attempt to separate the state from civil society is actually artificial, and 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 what what happens is something that I think is again. Can't, couldn't be more evident now, but I think the seeds were there from from the beginning. W what happens is that the the um, the state now, in this reduced form, as this sort of pure procedural, um, um, you know, regulation of external behavior that is simply meant to establish the grounds for people to pursue their vision of the good. That reduced conception of the state actually becomes the governing horizon that that informs um the way we conceive of of all goods within it and so i, I sort of made the, the the argument already before but if you know if we think of the state as just providing rules of fairness in fact that sets a horizon for what good what what is allowed to count as good in fact and so how, how does that get translated how do we see that we see that in this sort of cultural expression of, uh, of, of tolerance, 
<clears throat> tolerance of diversity and so forth as the absolute uh, measure for all human behavior. So, I mean, we see that that's an example of how, in fact, a certain conception of the state does willy-nilly, uh, people misunderstand the word, the, the, the um, etymology of willy-nilly is will he, nil he. The original right. meaning is whether or not one wants it. Um, it's sort of necessarily um, this 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 reduced conception of the state will will uh, necessarily um, uh, give form to even our our cultural activity in civil society. It forms what we mean by religion. It forms what we, what we mean by marriage. What we mean by friendship. What we mean by a church. What we mean. I mean, you know, on and on and on and on. Um, it's 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 being informed by the state. Yeah, you make this great argument um, that, you know, if, if there's something greater than the political common good over which the state has authority, that implies that the, and, and that it's re religion belongs to that something greater. Mm -hmm. um, or if from a Catholic perspective, maybe a Catholic version of this argument would, would be that religion is simply is that something greater, yeah. not contained in the, the political common good. That would imply that the state itself is contained within and subordinate to that greater good. Yeah. That it, that is, you say, if politics is humbly considering itself only a part of the common good, then the state must be ordered to the church. Yeah. But in fact, what actually happens um, in this common good minimalism is what you just said. Um, it the the. It treats the minimalism of the political common good as the prior upon which the, the various potentialities of the wider common good would follow. Right. So that – such that that wider common good is actually subservient. Yeah. So so the, the state is this – essentially this kind of negative space yeah. within which the church and civil society Exist. are contained. Yeah. And so, like you were saying, it ends up li limiting the horizon for our view of the common good because the the negative principle becomes the first principle. Yeah, it's not that it's not the it's not the greater, wider common good that's determining the horizon of the state. Exactly. It's quite the opposite. That's that's right. And then that horizon becomes the de facto common good that is, in any event, established. Yeah. This. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is one of the um, excuse me that the the. the uh, um, sort of classic Catholic neoconservative arguments that you know one can have a lot of sympathy for, um, and th there there are many good people that represent this position. But but talk about um, the uh, n you know subsidiarity and the need to um, do more justice to um, intermediate associations. So you have the individual on the one side and you have the state on the other, but there are all sorts of intermediate communities and institutions among which is the church and i mean that's that's an old that's a an you know kind of a, 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 a an old argument um uh, right that's been around for, for for good reason but uh if you step back and look at it, what what you're saying is uh just what you described that, that it becomes the state then is, that actually is sort of sets the horizon within which the church has its place but the horizon is already set, and that horizon is actually going to determine in all sorts of um, uh, profound ways um, the, 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 the nature of, the shape of, the practice of, uh, the reality of um, the various associations. So it seems to me it's much better to think of it the other way around. In fact, that the church is the more englobing reality, and the state is an association inside of the church. Um, now, one has to be very careful to how to work out the details. Some that doesn't mean that um, you're making the church the, the de facto political rule. And I, I have some criticism of uh, certain strands of integralism that I think move in that direction. That 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 think that that implies that the church uh, ought to uh, be a political agent. Um, um, this is a, a uh, a simplification of their position, and again, there are many different integralists. There's a spectrum here, um, but but one version of it is that the the church ought to be um, a political agent among other political agents, and and um, you know, act in a way in um, 
in and on the state um, in a kind of, um, you know, according to the model of uh, you know, ultimately a kind of coercive uh, sense of power. Whereas I, I think that the, um, the, the, the point is that the church is the englobing uh, uh, whole, as it were, precisely in a liberating sense and in a properly transcendent sense. So that the, the church determines the ultimate horizon of things, but it's precisely that that enables one to rule naturally. <laughs> um, it, it actually opens up space for the properly political. Um, uh, so I, 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 you know, I would still maintain that the church has to be understood as an authority um, and not simply as, you know, uh, a matter of private conviction. The church has to be understood as a public authority, but it's a public authority about the ultimate meaning of things and the ultimate destiny of things, um, which enables the temporal authority to operate of the state to operate or, you know, of, of the political order to operate properly. This question is often put in terms of whether this religion is within the purview of the state and to some extent, there, that's a legitimate way of putting it, but it might be better phrased as whether the state is in the purview of religion. Yeah. And I, and to to give an analogy, I'd like to go back to the the discussion of uh, the Supreme Court and abortion, which you mentioned at the beginning of this interview, because you used the word uh, in describing their position. You used the word. Uh, I think you said we we can't decide. It's not for us to decide when life begins. Mm -hmm. And the, that word decide is very important right. because it frames it already as a matter of decision. There you go. I've used this same uh, argument in discussing with uh, the, sort of the, the Catholic feminist position about matters of authority in the family and marriage. And um, people will say, well, I don't know why we have to be, um, you know, uh, fixated on questions of who who's in charge or you know who has authority, and my response to that is, well, we don't have to be fixated on it, but but um, it's not so much a matter of choosing to be what to be fixated on as as recognizing a reality that doesn't come from you. So that if you're given authority, um, it's actually a rebellion against authority to disown your own authority yeah. because because that authority precisely comes from a higher level. There you go. And so yeah. so that applies in discussions of the family that that to claim one's authority can be an act of humility or to 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 own it, yeah. which is a, a fascinating word. That word own, yeah. which you discuss in a footnote in a really interesting way, which we can't even get into. Yeah. But um, but uh, I wanted to bring that as an analogy yeah. to the discussion of setting one's own limits because you you point out you can't set your own limits because to recognize limits on your authority is to submit to a, to a limiter and right. if you're setting your own limits then you are claiming yourself as the actual authority in the very moment that's right in which you pretend to disown authority so so to deter for the state to dis, to, to recognize limit to determine its own limits with regard to religion is actually to usurp authority about what lies beyond its limits. Right. And you make this great analogy to the false modesty of modern science, mm -hmm. which claims to limit its own purview about recognizing that which is beyond its limits. And therefore, it's not just recognizing its own sphere. It, it's, it's obstinately refusing to be informed by what's above it. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. That's that's exactly the point. I mean, <clears throat> I, I think this is, you know, and it's it's very interesting. I mean, the connection with science, the and um, the, the what goes on in the sphere of science and what goes on in the sphere of politics in in the modern era are are really illuminate each other. And there's there's a there's a, a deeper connection between those than one often uh, recognizes. You mentioned um, Michael Hamby, one of my colleagues. He's he's writing quite a bit about um, this. Um, the 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 sort of collusion between politics and a certain tech, technocratic uh you know right. technocratic view of both politics and 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 nature and science right um i think that's something that which really, has seen its full its sort of full flowering and flexing of its limbs in the past couple of years yeah that's right that's right i mean that you know it's, it's interesting these might have seemed to be radical arguments um 
you know, when my father was making them in, in the 80s, but, uh, 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 the, 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 you know, it's and that at this point, we're kind of stating the obvious about so many things. But, um, yeah, I, the, the idea of um, uh, uh, competence is a really interesting one. Um, uh, in the, you know, the claim of incompetence, um, in a, in a, according to the liberal mo model, gets interpreted as um, a kind of abdication of any responsibility. So, um, um, you know, to say that you're in incompetent in something means that you have no, you, you don't respond to it. You have no, um, um, it doesn't concern you. Uh, but, but that's actually, I mean, that's a confused sense of, uh, of, of, that's an incompetent view of incompetence, in fact. And I mean, it, you know, it's, I, I'm not competent to fix cars. Right. So I, I, but when I, but when I confess that incompetence, what, what, what does that imply immediately uh, for, for any reasonable person? It means that I seek out those who are competent and I have to make judgment to the best of my ability, who's most competent and entrust myself, uh, my, you know, uh, you know to, to that person precisely because I'm incompetent. So there's, there's the very confession of incompetence goes along with the, um, uh, recognition of a higher authority. Um, and, but it seems to me in the political sphere, we tend not to see it that way. We, when the state professes incompetence in matters of religion, there's no deference to a higher authority in the matter. Um, uh, apart from the absolute, uh, individual will. And, um, in fact, that, as you say, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's an incompetence that's very secretly, makes itself the final judge in these matters, um, uh, uh, you know, according to the model that you just, you just presented there with science. Right. Yeah. And to, to put a button on that, you, uh, just to quote the book again, you say the only way for the state to avoid making itself a religious authority in its service of the common good is to officially recognize the authority of an actual religious body. Yeah. So this this book is a lot more about a lot more than just church and state, mm -hmm. although it all comes to bear on that question. Mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the book, you have a beautiful discussion of property, and um, you mentioned earlier that you think that's the the center, the core of the book. And uh, although I loved that chapter, um, I didn't have that awareness yeah. as I was reading it. So I'm curious as to why you why you would say that's the core of the book. Yeah, there there would be again so much to say. Uh, I, um, uh, it seems to me, first of all, you know, property um, is uh, it's the ground that we walk on. <laughs> it's as as sort of foundational as as anything. And um, uh, one of the things that struck me in thinking about all of these um, questions is um, how much the transformation, the kind of evolution in our concept of property became a kind of symbolic expression of, of the whole theme. Um, uh, initially, um, in the, you know, in the ancient world to, to summarize in a kind of a simplistic way, a, a, a very complex reality, um, in the ancient world, you know, it's captured in the word dominion, um, uh, to, to, to own property is, is precisely to, you know, uh, God put Adam in the, the garden in order to tend it and ha make it flourish. And that was precisely an expression of Adam's dominion um, that entailed also his using of things. But his use of things um, was was a kind of the fruit, quite literally, of his bringing things to flourish. And and the, the, the original meaning of dominion is this sort of belonging to, being responsible for, being the custodian of uh, a, a reality that has been given to us, something that um, that that we don't produce, but we 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 recognize is already there and having a claim on us, um, and and uh, responding to it in a creative and affirming sort of way. What what happens in um, this is most evident in John Locke's theory of property, but one can trace it back to um, certain theological debates in the late Middle Ages. Um, uh, property was reconceived not as my attaching myself to some reality, like in a state, um, you know, 
I find it fascinating that the, the, the old French tradition that, that people were named, that their fundamental name uh, was given by the estate that they lived on and that they cared for. Um, uh, there's, there's a profound significance of that. But, um, you know, rather than sort of belonging to a state, instead we think of property uh, essentially as having the form of taking something uh, out of the world and into um, the, the privacy of my absolute governance of myself, my absolute dominion over myself, um, which, you know, ultimately is just the, this perfect circle of the self's, you know, uh, uh, obsessive self-relation. We sort of consume the world and bring it into that relation, and you know if that's uh, um, if uh, if that's true at this fundamental level, you see you see it echoing all the way up and down in every other relationship. Um, so so it becomes a, a really interesting place um, to to see the 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 the, the truth of 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 this um, of this of these claims of this argument. So that's one dimension of it. Then the, the other dimension is that, um, uh, you know, it's the book is called Politics of the Real. And at the core of it is this idea that we need to found our interpretation of politics on reality. We need to we need to sort of recover a sense of the givenness and the goodness of reality um, as the starting point. And uh, one of the simplest ways of doing that is is recognizing the extraordinary um, um, uh, glory of the things. The, I mean, it's quite concrete. The very things that populate our existence, the very things around us, um, um, and you know, recognize already that uh, that all of human community sort of gathers around such things. Um, um, the the you think of the the fireplace in the home. I mean, that's that. There's an extraordinary history. In fact, I think uh, this is a history that really ought to be written. Uh, that would be a very interesting book uh, of the fireplace and um, how how home life was structured around it. It was not only it, um, um, you know very practically uh, necessary for heating and for cooking. Um, it was also, um, you know, the, 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 the altar uh, of, of, of the home. Um, it, it was the, the, the place wherein uh, the, the religious rites would be celebrated. It was the place of gathering, it was the place of community. Um, uh, so, so you see the, the, the community sort of takes shape around this, this, this real thing. Um, what we have, you know, with our, with our kind of... Uh, you know, technocratic reduction of the meaning of nature, which goes hand in hand with this kind of uh, abstract um, sense of, uh, of of property. We've eliminated the reality of things around which human community forms, and it seems to me we've had to reorder community on on totally new grounds that are no longer connected to reality, and then reality has to reinterpret itself to fit these things. And uh, uh, it seems to me that, that, you know, I hope that's not a too abstract way of describing it, but it seems to me so many of our cultural and political problems um, are expressions of that, you know, placing an abstraction, you know, the abstraction of nature's God, the abstraction of a concept, the abstraction of, you know, pure possibility, um, uh, pure freedom, the abstraction of the, of the unencumbered self. We've, we've now placed that at the center of things. Um, and that, you know, that's going to bear bad, increasingly bad fruit. Well, you talk about the, the two directions in which property goes properly conceived that, um, yes, it is an incorporating into yourself, but precisely not, not to sort of remove it from the world. It's, it's, it's made into an extension of oneself yeah. self and therefore sort of raised up and elevated that's right. these things, uh, whether they be you know, living things less than human beings or inanimate objects or land um they are they are raised up and they're made but they're also made our way of uh extending our presence to the world so in the sense they are the way in which we make ourselves part of the economy. that's right and uh and and paradigmatically there's this whole discussion we can't get into of why the body is sort of the paradigmatic 
example by which we should understand property yeah. rather than conceiving the, of the body according to the liberal understanding of property as something that's totally alienable and that's right. and something that can be separated from myself my innermost self that's right. Um, yeah, and then so but th th there's this whole there's this whole echoing theme um, on higher and higher levels of the idea of um, you know nature being absorbed into culture, you know. So there's like property being absorbed into human life. There's there's nature being absorbed into be, being raised up into culture. There's right. Uh, right. there's there's right. you know lower levels of community being raised up into higher levels of community. Right. There's this the state right. not violating and and not disrespecting the integrity of things which are beneath it, but raising them up right. and raising up the individual pursuit of the good. Uh, in and echoing its transcend the transcendent character of every individual's pursuit of the good, right. and uh, and of course highest of all with the church, and so I can see why the discussion of property is very important in that respect to all of these other. Um, That's right. These other themes. Yeah, it's. I mean, you know, the soul, the uh, the the soul extends into the world precisely in the body. The body really is right. the soul's presence in the world and then property is sort of the extent the, the analogous extension of that um yeah and it's it's a reflection of the very point we began the discussion with, with which is the incarnation i mean um yeah to see that is to understand that god's revelation of himself in uh not only just in the person of christ but in the embodied person in the flesh and blood of christ and and you know that there's you see the obvious connection between these two points um you recognize yeah, and the, the social church, reality yeah, of the church as as taking flesh as god sort of taking flesh in the in the world in this extended way that's that that um that's also um the the most proper way i think of understanding what property is um yeah and then the denial of the incarnation gets reflected in this denial this reinterpretation of property um as as uh you know pure um object of you know al alienable objects of 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 use and abuse um uh, whatever one wants to do with it yeah and this soul body thing keeps coming back to uh for example you mentioned aquinas says that the the, the state is sort of like a soul of souls yeah. that the state is to the individual um individuals in society as as uh in some respects, at least, as the soul is to the parts of the body. And then that's one reason why we can't see the purpose of the sole purpose of the state to be preserving the uh, the individual parts right. and not raising them up into a higher unity. That's right. Much as the soul isn't the purpose of the soul isn't for the sake of the body. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, there's obviously all sorts of nuances and paradoxes right, in that. that you're we, identified. It's not a yeah. totally uni unilateral type of thing, right. but right. Um, but and so and then also then Leo the Thirteenth makes the analogy uh, between the church and the state and the soul and the body. So that soul body thing keeps returning in all these levels. Yeah. No. In fact, I have a, a book that'll be coming out. I think at the beginning of next year that develops that point uh quite substantially oh, it's called um uh, god in the city um great uh, but yeah it makes that that argument uh at, at length <laughs> so before we close um do you think you could give us at least a, a taste of your i mean the subtitle of the book is the church between liberalism and integralism so can we close with a bit of a taste of what your proposed alternative uh, between those two th uh, things is yeah it, it I would say it shares with um, integralism the notion that the church is meant to be um, an authority in the in the world and not simply a matter of private belief um, you know a sort of recovery of a sense of the kingship of Christ and 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 so um, that's that's one dimension but I, I think um, uh, in contrast to at least again some versions of integralism, um, uh, uh, it seems to me the best way to understand that is is through a, a, a reinvigorating, um, a kind of a, um, a, a, a recovery of a, a of a more robust and flourishing sense of what politics means simply, the political order simply. Um, so. Um, you know, there's not an immediate intrusion of the 
of theological questions into the political order that that our our um, political order the relationship between the church and the state if to use that language needs to be mediated by metaphysics by the true the good and the beautiful um as as defining the horizon of human existence and that that once once we see that we we recognize that um you know there's there's a there's a there's an opening up uh to this increasingly sort of common um emphasis on on localism this this recovery of a sense of the home as the first place of human community um you know the 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 the, the cell of uh a, of the social order, um, a sense of local communities having a certain integrity and priority. You know, all of those things are reflections of this emphasis on the real as the center. Um, and I, I, I don't know that um, uh, that uh, integralism will, will tend to, to move much more quickly to questions of uh, who's in charge, um, uh, the you know almost exclusively the church state question uh, questions of coercive power and so forth I think all those are eventually important but they're secondary the first is is a recovery of um, a, a very human sense of politics I see um, I'd like to actually ask one more question sure. going back to what we were talking about earlier because some people might be nervous when we're talking about um, you know how the, there's a problem in framing religious freedom as a matter of having various options. Yeah. So that doesn't necessarily mean that an, a non-liberal state would suppress right. all other religions right. besides Catholicism. So can you talk a little bit about why, in your view, uh, the non-liberal a non-liberal uh, vision of religious uh, liberty would still be able to deal in a non-destructive way with the fact of religious plurality yeah i mean i i actually think that um that it's only an embrace of uh well I mean, this is very a very polemical way to put it but but it seems to me that embrace of the the church the catholic church specifically catholic uh church actually um enables one to affirm uh a certain kind of pluralism of religions even more respectfully than liberalism does i mean the 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 the, the point would be um uh, uh precisely through and and drawing on the resources of the cr christian tradition one um discovers the foundation for the affirmation of uh individual dignity um you know the 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 um need to uh, uh, avoid coercion in religious matters and so forth. I mean, these these things about sort of what we would call respect for individual rights. It seems to me we need to we actually need to have a robust tradition that allows us to affirm those things. We've we've lived too long on the capital of that tradition, but it's becoming increasingly clear that without a substantial anthropology and um, behind that, you know, theology. Um, we don't have the resources to respect individual rights. So, so I mean, um, the uh, what what appears to be religious freedom uh, and respect for individuals actually, in, in in all sorts of ways, is an undermining of that. So, um, you know, this opens up a huge set of questions which we don't really have time to enter into. But um, um, uh, you know, just to spell out very practically, um, uh, if to 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 the the whole point is to affirm the truth of you know the the truth of human existence and if that um uh if if coercion in religious matters is incompatible with the truth of the person which i think it is then that can't be part of the vision you see what i mean um, right uh uh you know any anything that would sort of you know threaten violence to um non-believers uh uh, those kinds of things uh, are excluded precisely from this. Um, again, by drawing on the tradition, not by stepping outside of it. Right. And we might, with regard to the church's teaching on religious liberty found in Dignitatis Humanae, repeat 
the quote that I from your book that I gave earlier, the only way for the state to avoid making itself a religious authority in its service of the common good is officially to recognize the authority of an actual religious body. And this is precisely the argument that Thomas Pink makes yeah. about Dignitatis Humanae, that if this church teaching on religious liberty is based not only on the natural law, but also on the on the fact of divine revelation, uh, specifically removing a religious coercion from from the purview of the state, then that means that only a Catholic a state that recognizes this Catholic principle is is going to guarantee religious liberty in the Catholic sense. There you go. And to the extent that it doesn't, it's betraying the Catholic vision. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, David, thanks so much for coming on this show. Um, I, I, I look forward to finishing the book. I didn't, uh, I didn't mention earlier in the interview that I, I still have about 40 pages to go. I'm in the last section there. Uh, but I've gotten a tremendous amount out of it. I'm, I'm really glad to have uh, discovered your work, and I look forward to reading more in the future. When, uh, this book is published by New Polity Press, I should mention, right. um, and I will link to their site in the show notes. But also, uh, I wanted to know when's your next? Uh, who's publishing your next book? Well, I, I actually have t two uh, that are coming out. One is um, a, a part two uh, uh, of of a tri uh, projected trilogy. Um, the Freedom from Reality, you mentioned that uh, book earlier, that was uh, volume one um, that was meant to be a, a kind of a, um, an, uh, an analysis of the, of the contemporary situation. The part two, volume two, is coming out in uh, the fall, in October, I think, with Notre Dame Press, and that's called Retrieving Freedom, and that one is um, uh, discusses the, the Christian appropriation of the classical tradition and the meaning of, of freedom. Um, but then the other book that I mentioned to you, God in the City, um, that, that'll be a smaller volume that is being published by um, St. Augustine's Press in okay, South Bend. Great. Um, and that should be coming out next spring. Well, thank you very much, David. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time uh, to read the book. I, uh, I'm grateful for it. Anybody who's listening, please do subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. And uh, I'd also like to say, I think this is the first episode coming out after we finished our Easter fundraising campaign at catholicculture.org. Um, we have two major fundraising campaigns every year, and uh, one is in Easter and the other is in the Advent season. And we succeeded in making our $60,000 challenge grant. So that means everybody who donated in that period, their donation was doubled. That helps us to get through the slow uh, donation months of the summer. So I'm really grateful to all of my listeners who subscribed. Uh, thank you very much. We do pray for our benefactors daily, and uh, we hope you'll pray for us as well. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.